a water footprint. It's shorthand for all the water that went into growing your food. And if that food's meat, that means a lot of water. Just think, before it was a hamburger, a cow drank water, and more importantly, it had to eat. And food is the biggest part of all of our water footprints. Since a cow eats more per pound than a pig or a chicken, and definitely more than a vegetable, swearing off beef isn't a bad way to reduce your personal water footprint. But here's the thing. What a cow eats on a feedlot, which in the U.S. is generally a mix of corn and soybeans, is grown very differently throughout the country, so it has wildly different water impacts. In some places, rainfall provides enough water for crops to grow. But in other places, irrigation is needed, and that water comes from aquifers and streams. Irrigation isn't necessarily a big deal if a lot of water is available, but it's often the culprit when water shortage looms. So, to quantify the impact of meat, we need to know both how much irrigation water went into it and whether water was scarce. It turns out, though, that it's surprisingly hard to know how and where feed was grown. Because corn and soy are commodity crops. They get mixed together, then sent off in all different directions, and we don't keep track of what goes where. Even most of the companies that sell meat don't really know where their feed comes from. That makes it pretty hard for them to reduce their water impact. Enter a team of scientists from the universities of Minnesota and New Mexico. We enhanced a model that connects the dots, linking meat processing facilities to the animals that come through their doors and back to the corn and soy that fed them. And we found some pretty interesting patterns. Here's a big one. The average doesn't tell you much about the embedded irrigation water in your burger. Where that burger was processed affects where the feed came from, and that's what matters. For example, a lot of beef processing facilities are located over the High Plains Aquifer. So cows processed there eat corn and soy grown with ancient water, and farmers there are already wrestling with falling groundwater levels. Our team didn't stop with beef, though. We also traced chicken and pork. Now, you were right about the hamburger. On average, beef has much more embedded irrigation water than other kinds of meat. But because of where their food comes from, chicken and pork also have a lot of variation. Some of those chickens actually have more embedded irrigation water than cows raised in certain areas. All right, that's livestock. But let's change gears for a second, because it's not just that meat that eats a lot of corn. Ethanol, which is blended into gasoline, is another huge consumer, and we tracked it too. Because of where ethanol facilities are located, they mainly source rain-fed corn. But of the 16% of ethanol feedstock that is irrigated, 80% comes from places experiencing water shortage. So how does that irrigated water get all the way to you, the consumer? It turns out that in the U.S., 78% of irrigated feed ends up in meat sold by just six companies. 39% of irrigated feedstock for ethanol ends up in biofuel sold by just five companies. Until now, there hasn't been data to trace water at such a granular level. So our findings can help these companies identify and manage risk in their own supply chains, and also provide consumers with information to make sure they, and the companies they buy from, are good environmental stewards. Let's get back to that burger. Most of the time, yes, it is going to have a bigger water impact than chicken or pork, and it's definitely got a bigger water footprint than lima beans or lettuce. But thanks to this research, we can zoom into your specific burger and follow its unique supply chain to get a much clearer picture of whether it's a water bruiser or a water lightweight.